Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Versus. I'm your host, Mark Ellis. If you're new here, welcome. We have punch and cookies. Let me tell you how this program works. You see, we at Versus take art and make it competitive. Sometimes it can get tough and we have to remove the gloves off of two Academy Award winning filmmakers or movies or performers. Other times it's Robocop versus Terminator. That are alive, you are coming with me. And today, that whole art getting competitive thing kicks into high gear with moves like a body slam or a kill switch or a the people's elbow. Not only do I have three distinguished actors on the show today who will not physically be in this room, that'd be very intimidating for my little water pistols, but they've all forged a bountiful career on the big screen after making their debut on the world stage with wrestling. That's right, we're cooking up a worldwide wrestling winner-take-all match featuring Dwayne The Rock Johnson, John Cena, and Dave Batista. In one corner, you have The Rock. He's that little blue pill that every franchise craves, and he's made his mark in everything from Fast and Furious movies to the world of DC with Black Adam. I kneel before no one. In the next corner, it's John Cena, who kicked off his Hollywood career with fun actioners like the Marine before hitting it big with comedies and the DC property, The Suicide Squad. Peacemaker. It's actually very nice. And in the third and final corner, it's a triangle ring today, kiddos. We have Dave Batista, who can go from high profile sci-fi like Blade Runner 2049 to cracking jokes in the MCU as Drax in the Guardians of the Galaxy movies. <laughs> Three tremendous careers, approximately a billion hours combined in the gym, and damn near a trillion bucks earned in tickets sold, pay-per-views witnessed, and merchandise generated. But there's only one belt, and it's so big and shiny that even an old-school Texas cowboy would say, Hoo-wee! That's some buckle. Why are you wearing it on your shoulder, son? It's a good pickup line. Here's how we'll determine a winner. Round one, box office. Round two, tomato meter slash audience score. Round three, character. Round four, iconic moments. And then we'll do a wild card round that just might involve a bunch of begging from me that the two losers of today's match don't take it personally and challenge me to a push-up contest. I can now do seven of the diamond ones without crying. I will beat your ass like a Cherokee drum. This Versus episode will feature their Tinseltown careers as opposed to their exploits in the ring, but we'll pepper in some oiled up spice into the festivities to give it some seasoning. It's three of the greatest, most popular wrestlers of this millennium who've made the leap from the ring to the screen, big and small, and now they delight audiences of all ages in just about every section that Blockbuster Video has to offer. And that's not past tense, by the way. There's still one in Bend, Oregon, and I hear it's going strong. And I think I have like $30 in late fees there. Okay. Okay, everyone ready? Crowd set? Cue the music, get on your feet, and let's get it on. I don't want to get sued by a buffer today. We are ready to rumble! Round one, box office. And now, dear viewer, I make you a promise. The match that ensues today will likely come down to the wire. It'll be super tight, and there's no real losers here. Just one performer who's a little more winnier than the other two. But in this round, John Cena and Dave Batista are facing a mountain named Dwayne, who, coincidentally, is the guy from Race to Witch Mountain. Will you remind him that I'm a man and he's a dog? And even if that Witch Mountain movie isn't the first film that comes to mind when I say The Rock, it still made over $100 million worldwide. So did Planet 51 and The Tooth Fairy and The Scorpion King, which was his debut in a starring role. Those kind of numbers alone would make him tough to beat in this round, but those movies aren't why they call him movie franchise Cialis. That has got to go to work. The dude has been in two movies that have grossed over a billion dollars at the box office. Furious 7 hauled in $1.5 billion, and The Fate of the Furious, which I'll give anyone one dollar if they can tell me which one that is in the franchise, made 1.2 billion bones. He got close to another bill with Jumanji Welcome to the Jungle, which fun and gamed its way to a $961 million haul. The sequel, accurately titled The Next Level, grossed $798 million. So this guy's got the goods. Oh, yeah. Before I continue to run down, that's another movie he's in. Add 80 million more into the bank under the name Johnson. Let's see if his opponents have a prayer of keeping pace so far. Actually, they do. <sighs> their lack of pharmaceutical friendly nicknames aside, Cena and Batista both boast their own series of gaudy digits. Johnny. Nope. 
I feel really weird saying I'm sorry. Just like The Rock sees his best blockbuster as a part of the Fast Saga, and his participation in Part 9 as a long-lost relative, yeah, that helped take in $721 million. He also steered into the world of Transformers, and Bumblebee was certainly more than meets the eye, computing $465 million worth of coin. And fair warning, that movie's opening eight minutes on Cybertron is maybe the best short film ever created. It might be the best piece of art in the history of humans or robots. It, as the kids say, slaps. <laughs> Cena also popped into the daddy's home flicks, and those two films tag team to generate over $400 million. And not even a pandemic could dampen the spirits of the Suicide Squad, which would notch $167 million. Cena's comedies perform admirably as well, and he's great in them, as evidenced by Blockers' is $94 million and Trainwreck's $141 million bones. So as huge as those pie slices are, they're probably not enough to take down the feast currently being gorged by The Rock. How about you, Davey? Yeah, everyone knows. No. Yeah, I definitely should not call him that. Step right up. It won't hurt that long. What? Dave Batista has the highest and second highest grossing film of any competitor in the show today. Even you, Dwayne. Hello. Remember those Avengers movies? Yeah, they tend to do okay, and Drax was featured in both Avengers Infinity War and Endgame, both of which broke the bank with over $2 billion each. Endgame almost got to three bills and is in constant competition with Avatar as the Who can re-release itself more to claim the all-time worldwide box office crown. This is our land! Oh, from there, Batista can also brag about the 007 feature Spectre, which grossed $879 million, Dune, which generated almost $400 million worth of spice, and Blade Runner 2049, as that long-awaited sequel notched $258 million. Oh, and he's not done with the MCU. So far, the two Guardians films have combined for over $1.6 billion, and Thor Love and Thunder and Roses earned $737 million, and Drax was there for a fun sequence featuring Guns N' Roses. Yeah, that band really gets around. Keep your eye on them. Hmm. Well, sweet children, it looks like a runaway victory for The Rock, but Cena and Batista have posted enough winning returns to make me do a ton more math. All told, John Cena movies have taken in $2.2 billion, making for a per movie average of $197 million. That's what the old timers call BAFO. What? Then we have Batista, whose MCU resume aids him in generating almost $9 billion, resulting in an astonishing, are you sitting down, $528 million per movie. Okay, hang on, my jaw's on the floor. I'll pick it up. That pummels The Rock's average of $348 million, and that's the first time in history that $300 million sounds like jump change. But The Rock has been at this film game longer, and his flicks altogether make for $12.2 billion worldwide. Okay, so Dwayne has the better raw number, Dave has the better average, Batista is welcome as Drax for any big screen adventure or birthday party that I throw for myself. But when you consider the totality of everything going on in the MCU, it wasn't necessarily his might that propelled the Avengers films to their record-breaking totals. And it's true, The Rock was just one of many crucial pieces in the Fast and Furious films, but he also may have been the reason those movies rebounded from being a series with diminishing returns into a true bankable blockbuster endeavor, beginning with Rocky's first tussle with Vin in Fast Five. That flick took in $630 million, which is $3 million less than Moana, and it set the double Fs on a path of bank deposits that's still going strong today. Dwayne wins a surprisingly competitive round one, and he's on the board first. One to nothing to nothing. Yeah! Round two, tomato meter slash audience score. Money is great, it makes the world go round, but it can't buy happiness. Yeah, maybe it can. Put a pin in that. But what it can't do is change how we feel about a film after we see it. Or in the case of many MCU and DC properties, after we see it again and again and again, they're all really enjoyable. These guys. What's this one do? But is that how the critics felt about these films after witnessing it? The tomato meter will reveal all. And what it doesn't show us, the audience score is there representing us, the people, whose champ I still think is The Rock. Is that right? <laughs> I currently also love Liv Morgan, who is a guest on my podcast, Rotten Tomatoes is Wrong. We talked about Saw a whole lot. It was good times. John Cena and Dave Batista were smart to let Dwayne make his career transition first, because for Johnson, it wasn't all sunshine to begin. But Batista made an impact right away, pitching into the man with the iron fist, and then Riddick, which hit an almost fresh 51 and 57% respectively on the tomato meter. Then he hit Fresh Town as Guardians of the Galaxy scored a 92%, then Volume 2 held strong with an 85%. That ties it with Infinity War, and then Endgame came out, and we all cried and cheered and went back for 
for more, and apparently so did the critics. It's 94% on the Meter de Tomato. He's on a nice fresh jog currently, as Army of the Dead, Dune, and Thor Love and Thunder are all safely in fresh territory. John Cena got kicked off of the multiplex with the aforementioned Marine. It's a fun action movie, and it's got a very clever Terminator reference with Robert frickin' Patrick standing right there. It should have been a fresh film just for that, but it gets weighed down at 17%. <laughs> From there, it was a rotten struggle with movies like Legendary and The Reunion, but then we saw another side of Cena in Trainwreck as one of Amy Schumer's romantic liaison. The movie nailed it with an 84% on the TM, then Sisters also got fresh with 60% even. Bumblebee ranks as his all-time best in terms of movies, with a 91% followed closely by The Suicide Squad at 90%, and Blockers at 84%. And I know we all love Dwayne as Maui and Moana, but let's not forget that Cena's animated hit Ferdinand is fresh at 71%. Oh, mama. And now on to Johnson, whose career started rocky with some negative critical reactions for his first handful of starring roles. In fact, his first dozen feature films only have one fresh movie emerge. And it's, you guessed it, The Rundown. Gridiron Gang, Southland Tales, and Race to Witch Mountain all landed in the 40% range, and it wasn't until The Other Guys that he scored another fresh film when that 2010, I'll call it a classic, chuckled up 78%. That's also the tomato meter numeral for Fast Five, and more freshness was to follow. Both Jumanji films are in the 70% set, Fighting With My Family is 93%, and Moana tops everyone with a 95%. But I will point out that Cena's starring turn in the Peacemaker streaming show is at 94%, and it earns that just for the opening credits alone. The audience score favors The Rock as barely fresh movies like Jungle Cruise's 62% tomato meter number speed up to 92% with the audience score metric. That's also the best percentage audience film for Dave Bautista, who wins that courtesy of Guardians of the Galaxy. John Cena's best audience output are the twin 82% generated by The Suicide Squad and Fast 9. So let's go once again to the law of averages. The Rock's audience score gets into fresh territory with a 64% average across all his films. That tops both Bautista Batista's 47% and Cena's 56%. But the all-time average king for the tomato meter is not Dwayne. His average is 52%, which is better than John Cena's 46%, but it can't match Dave's 56%. And since the tomato meter came first, that's the tiebreaker. Age before beauty, even though I think Batista's younger than The Rock. Look, they're all beautiful, but Dave Batista takes the win in a nail-biting round two, and we're tied at the top one to one, and now John Cena hopes to get on the board in round three. <laughs> round three, character. Like I said, Cena is itching to tie this thing up at the top by winning his first round of the day, and if he pulls it off here, it'll be on the strength of his character work outside of the ring. Not you, Ferdinand. You can stay in that arena and still gain credit. And I will say, the niece and the nephews love them some Ferdinand. So does Uncle Mark. Yeah, I know. But still, when I come to visit my siblings and maybe borrow money, there seems to be a prevalent Hawaiian theme in the kiddos' playroom. Moana was not just another rousing success for Disney animation and their stunning legacy. It showcased The Rock being a fun personality who could also poke fun at himself, and he even gets to croon a little bit. Maui may not be the first character that comes to mind when we think of this wrestling hunk, but this new generation coming up, I think they're called Generation Alpha, is what we do with the tykes gotta be shit me. Get it together. They love them some Moana. And since Dwayne was the alpha at the movies first, he got to be the Scorpion King in a big time franchise like The Mummy. Then he stuck close to his action roots in bangers like The Rundown, Walking Tall, and Doom. The standout for me is his role as Beck in The Rundown, and despite all the great action that that film does have, for me, my favorite part is the quick blink and you'll miss it moment near the film's outset. Beck is heading into a nightclub to bash some football skulls, and who does he pass in the hallway? The, fun. the guy on his way out of the club is Arnold Schwarzenegger. It's a fun cameo on the surface, but the deeper meaning, yes, I found deeper meaning in this scene, represents a passing of the torch from the Terminator turned Governator to a new action hero for this millennium, the Rock. And with subsequent roles like Hobbs in the Fast films, Roadblock in G.I. Joe, and freaking Hercules, I'd say he carries that torch pretty well. Quite literally, in the case of Hercules, a role previously played by Arnold, the multi-time Mr. Olympia. But to win a character-based round, Dwayne's gonna have to keep the pressure up on these up-and-comers. They had the luxury of studying his career and making choices based on what worked and what didn't for Johnson. Don't push me. John Cena did the action thing as John Triton in the Marine, but then was able to quickly branch out to comedy and astound us with his brilliant. Seriously, the dude can nail a line. Just look at Trainwreck, Daddy's Home, and especially Blockers. Remember, stab 
turn drag. I don't have the knife. Dad. Yes, you do. Check your clutch. As Mitchell, the jort sporting overprotective dad of a high schooler, he teams up with fellow rents like Ike Barinholtz and Leslie Mann to form a trio of fall down funny guardians watching their babies grow up too fast. Dave Batista can also veer into yucks as evidence with his most popular role, Drax. Nothing goes over my head. My reflexes are too fast. A guy nicknamed the Destroyer may not have earned it by conquering worlds so much as making us roll in the aisles opening weekend. It's a testament to his timing that he can hang with and steal scenes from a talking raccoon, a sentient tree, and all the other goofiness that ensues in that franchise. Of course, he can also take on some more serious action as well. James Bond prefers to be the only cheeky one in his flicks, so as Hink's inspector, Dave settles for kicking lots of ass with minimal dialogue. In more recent films, Batista has extended his range to include leading movies like Army of the Dead, in which his Scott Ward faces undead hordes of evil, and in Stuber, where cop Vic Manning is able to both drive the action and keep up the chuckle pace alongside the great comedian Kumail Nanjiani, who's now also in the MCU. What a fun treehouse they must have, and big. <laughs> Yes! But Dave still hasn't had the reps of Johnson, who's been able to star in action vehicles that steer more towards a dramatic family angle. No, I'm being serious. Think about Rampage, San Andreas, and I know Skyscraper was probably sold on that impossible building-to-building -building leap that he pulls off. Can someone tell Tom Cruise that it wasn't real? I, I don't want him. Tom, relax. You've done enough. Just act. No. Dwayne Johnson stars as Will Sawyer, and with saving his fam as motivation, he adds some emotional weight to the summer popcorn storyline. What really impressed me was his role in Snitch. He plays John Matthews, who gets into some tangles that may not be strictly legal, but the dramatic twist the movie takes show off a deeper, more emotional rock who's not just relying on his biceps to win the day. But for me, John Cena has done so much in such a short period of time when it comes to establishing range as an actor. If he can't quite match the chops harnessed by The Rock, he might have already one-upped him in terms of raunchy comedy that may be a little adult-oriented, but come on, the kids are going to see that anyway. Probably on their own phone, in public, without AirPods. I don't need to hear your cellular device. It was just really nice what you said. It seems like every actioner, comedy, or other flick John Cena's done thus far has led him to his role as Peacemaker. And James Gunn has been able to provide a sandbox that Cena dominates with a deft ability that no one could have seen coming. He's funny in multiple ways, ranging from sarcastic to goofy to self-deprecating to blissfully unaware. Oh, and he also knows his way around a fight. It's certainly not the only role where he showcases his versatility, but it may be the best example of anyone in contention today. Without the aid of a rock-sized resume or the MCU buddies pitching in, John Cena has still established himself as a bankable star regardless of what genre of film you want to make. Hero, villain, lead, sidekick, the guy can do it all, and with a CGI eagle. Oh my god. He's hugging me. Cena sneaks up on Dave and Dwayne and steals round three, and now we're all tied up one to one to one. This is f amazing. Round four, iconic moments. Characters, much like their box office coin that their films create, are awesome. But movies and TV shows are more than just cool looking posters. And with stars like these, we want to be leaving the theater not remembering someone's name or costume or pet eagle. We want to be gushing about all those cool parts that made us odd, shocked, crying, laughing. You know, the ones that get us that second tub of popcorn. If we're looking at the best sequences, scenes, and segments in the movie library of these fellas, you gotta start with the action, right? And from the word go and that first gear shift, the audience knew it was in for something extra special with Fast Five. And by special, I'm referring to two hours of window smashing, bad guy pummeling, I think I'm on the right side of the law justice, and as far as hyped title cards go, I'd say that epic clash between Dom Toretto and Hobbs was worth it. What the hell was his full name? Was it Roy Hobbs? Oh, big mistake, kid. <laughs> no, 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 that's Bob Redford from The Natural. But in the same way that the stadium lights shatter during that most epic home run, seeing The Rock elevate this franchise from a racing movie set to a full-blown action-packed nitrous oxide boost rocket jet-fueled pack was something to behold. For kicks, I also love in Fate of the Furious when it's clear that rubber bullets are no match for a guy who wakes up at 4 a.m. to lift and is still in the gym at noon. Once Dwayne stepped out on his own in the Hobson Shaw spinoff, we were treated to the best prison brawl this side of the raid, too, and that final tussle with Statham and Johnson merging forces to defeat an Idris Elba that definitely would have an asterisk next to his name if he broke Hank Aaron's home run record, you gotta love it. Let's go unplug this son of a bitch. 
Other climactic clashes worth the wait include Walking Tall, where he takes down a very frisky Neil McDonough, Doom, where we get treated to a, um, I'll say plot twist, and even in The Scorpion King, it gets good when it's King versus Balthazar. I've come for the woman and your head. The special effects may be not quite ready to match the ambitions of the script, but enjoyable nonetheless. Speaking of big time endings, The Marine does at least show the potential for John Cena taking his wrestling skills and translating them well to mass audiences of the movies. He also gets his hands dirty against Vin Diesel in Fast 9, and The Suicide Squad features an all-time rumble in the jungle vibed slobber knocker when it's Peacemaker against Rick Flagg. Dave Batista, for all his brawn, has more memorable scenes for me that involve his funny bone. But I will give nod to the bones that he broke along the way in sequences like Spectre's train fight, the casino war in Army of the Dead, and even that funny store fight in Stuber. Plus, we at least gotta give an honorable mention to Master Z, Ip Man Legacy. Batista's got a good fight in there, but that whole movie is just wall-to-wall -wall popcorn munching excitement. There's huge chunks of the Guardians movies that spotlight Drax not as a brute, but as a unique, thoughtful, huge comic relief. Nothing goes over his head, at least not according to him. And while Guardians 2 may have tried a little too hard to outgiggle its predecessor, you can't help but fall in love with Drax and his mocking of Peter Quill a little bit more. So you just need to find a woman who is pathetic, like you. But what's that? Good God, that's John Cena's music. And he's doing a new move called the butt chug. Hey, <laughs> not working, dude. I can't. It's near the end of Blockers, and what was a funny movie up to that point shifted into fifth gear with that gag. Look, I enjoy my drinking sports, but I had never heard of that. And I went to college in North Carolina, where we're pretty inventive with our oak sodas. Don't try this move at home, kids. Stick with Flip Cup. Additionally, Cena improvised some really good lines in Trainwreck, and the dude can be laugh a minute in season one of The Peacemaker. That dude's out for peace, no matter how many men, women, and children he has to kill to get it, as long as we spare the eagle. Ooh, daddy's boy! But as impressive as these two fellas have been in their comparatively short time on the silver screen, there's a reason The Rock has been so consistently great for decades now. He can also handle a non-action scene with the perfect touch. A nice transition from ass kickery to funny bone ticklery is the other guys. There goes my hero onto the pavement. Pain and Gain also features laughs at his muscle-bound expense, but Moana, it's all heart and humor. His songs, his presence, he's cool, just not as cool as he thinks he is. And that opening scene of Central Intelligence, the flashback to high school, it's up there with his buddy Ryan Reynolds in Just Friends. Dusty. Body of work could mean many things when we're talking about the combined might and hunkery of Cena, Batista, and Johnson. Together they're what, maybe 900 pounds of pure A-list stardom? But The Rock, ranging from peck jumping silliness in Journey 2, all the way to the Furious 7 line, I am the Calvary, is just too much to ignore. Dwayne had the lead, the other fellas caught up, but now it's The Rock that wins round four, and he reclaims the outright advantage, two to one to one. <laughs> and now it's time for the wild card round, get in the ring. Hey, that's a Guns N' Roses song. One of the many recurring themes today. Another is that so far we've stuck with my initial notion of tossing these three heavyweights into battle based on their acting merits. But in news that I first learned last week, a little bit of some pro wrestling does involve performance. So let's get on board the night train for Paradise City and see whose in-ring exploits are deserving of a possible match ceiling point in our final round. The Rock exploded onto the wrestling scene in the latter part of the 1990s and and in a short period of time, he could stand shoulder to shoulder with all-time legends like Andre the Giant, Hulk Hogan, and Rowdy Roddy Piper. Born with brawling ability in his bloodline, Johnson eschewed a football career after an injury and leapt into the ring, delighting audiences with his patented finisher, the People's Elbow. Although I still maintain that the rock bottom might be a more effective tactic. Dude made this stuff look really good and really painful. Thank you so much. For John Cena, he was able to bridge Johnson and Batista simply by having massive WWE beef with both of them. They're braver than I, as I'd want no part of John's attitude adjustment, which started as a type of fireman's carry and ended like a kneeling takedown. He also had the power bomb in his arsenal, and more recently preferred finishers like the step over toe hold face lock, a move that I remind my brother that we were lucky to already have been adults by the time it came into fashion. <laughs> 
Batista took what was the Demon Bomb and made it his own, to the point where it's now known as the Batista Bomb. You get a spinebuster opener, which leads to a thumbs up, but that won't last long. Like Siskel and Ebert turning on a movie, the thumb goes down Roman Emperor style and then leads to a power bomb into a perfect pinning position, and before the opponent knows what happened, they've been felled by a guy who originally went by the name Leviathan. Yeah, that's not a name you want your competition to have earned. The Rock scored a Royal Rumble win in 2000, then Cena and Batista would both add two each to their resume from 2005 to 2015. It's here that I should point out Vin Diesel's defeated all three of these fellows on the big screen. Look, I'm just saying, it's all sports entertainment, and maybe we find a way to get everybody to patch things up and get rid of their little tiffs in time for Fast and Furious 15, Jurassic Mars. <laughs> We smelled The Rock's culinary skills first, then witnessed Batista have an incredibly long reign as a champ by holding the belt for 282 days between 2005 and 2006. But John Cena's stats have only one rival. Woo! Ooh, Ric Flair. They're tied at total championships with 16 apiece, so how do we break this deadlock that we have between our three competitors today? Okay, I know, I got it. Coolest character name. Batista is gonna set the bar at Drax the Destroyer. Cena can meet that with Peacemaker, but The Rock? Okay, so he played Boxer Santoros in Southland Tales, Jack Bruno in Race to Witch Mountain, but he's taken this round and thus the match by being referred to as Dr. Smolder Bravestone in Jumanji. Even Idris Chris Elba's stacker Pentecost in Pacific Rim thinks that name is pretty sweet. Dwayne Johnson wins the round and thus the match. Yes! <laughs> I'm sure my decision making will be questioned, and in a decade, I might overrule my own self. But for now, I give the slight edge to the guy who was also named David Okoye in Rampage. Are you kidding me? His names are really cool. But again, this is all just my opinion. So give me your take right now at Mark Ellis Live, and stay tuned right here at Rotten Tomatoes for everything from movies to TV to streaming shows to some other wrestlers who may become actors. Thanks for watching Versus. I'm Mark Ellis, and that is the bottom line.